Uh, I was born uh, March 23rd, 1968 in uh, West Texas. Did you grow up with both parents? For the most part. How was that? What was your childhood like? Pretty rough. Very abusive father. Um, yeah, it's pretty abusive. That's about all I can say on that. Have any siblings? Any brothers, sisters? Yeah, they're all in Texas and Georgia. Kind of scattered out. So, how long did you stay in Texas? Most of my life, till about five years ago. Then I moved up here. So, growing up, you went to school and high school? And doing got, my, got my GD and uh, always wanted to be an architect. Frank Lloyd Wright was my uh, inspiration, but due to drug addiction, got hooked on painkillers and I was a truck driver, so I was in and out of college. Tell me about that truck driving. How did you get from, you went, you got your GED and then went to school to be a truck driver? Yeah. What is that, like a certificate, I guess? Yeah, I got certified in Texas, Class A CDL. Started out hauling uh, salt water in the oil fields, and then eventually I went over the road all 50 states. How long did, were you truck driving for? Was that period? Quite a few years, about uh, 11 years. And did you, get a, you have family within that? Did you get married? Or? I was married and uh, to my high school sweetheart uh, in '91. Uh, our son was born in 92, Jeremy. He's 30 now. They both live in Austin. And that's your son? Yeah. yeah. So they don't know I'm living like this out here. You know. But uh, yeah, I um, always wanted to be an architect. That was my dream from my mom. Yeah. I love designing buildings. So whenever I get inspired, I design buildings. Uh, I went through a program at Bread of Life Mission downtown and did a mural for them, and it's still on the wall. It's in their lobby. Nice. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a layout of downtown Seattle, all the skyscrapers, all the streets. It was kind of like a gift that uh, I gave to them for them helping me out, yeah. But uh, this is my first time being homeless like this. And like I was saying earlier, I was living in SeaTac and uh, landlord got offered a position, got offered a good dollar amount of money for his property that he couldn't turn down. Gave us less than 30 days to try to find somewhere to live and rent is so high. I was unemployed and uh, none of us could uh, could afford to rent. So I know several of us are still in the streets because of that. Yeah. So it's hard for me to be out here on this corner, you know, asking the public for help. There's so many people out here homeless on the streets that a lot of people passing by, they get so tired of seeing us that they just keep on going or they'll change lanes or they'll sit way back here and wait till the light turns green and then they'll come through the intersection. That makes it even harder. Yeah. What does that feel like? It's very uh, discouraging. Yeah. And I had uh, all my uh, ID and stuff stolen, so I'm trying to get a new ID, new social security card. You gotta have ID to get ID. And tell me more about that process, because I know that that's hard for me to get. Well, the uh, they have this. The food bank here has a brochure where they have like three columns, and you check off what you can obtain, like maybe a birth certificate or. A, GD certificate or a high school diploma certificate, something like that that you can, uh, you may be able to get a hold of. And there's a lady, uh, 
with Reach that's trying to work with me, uh, trying to help me get some uh, information that I can get to get the uh, my ID and stuff. But it's a uh, it's a difficult process. Uh, they don't make it easy to get your ID card, and then you got to pay for that sucker too. And I think that's like 90 bucks. Costs more here than it does in Texas to get ID card. So I'd have <clears throat> nothing with my picture on it. So I can't even get a job. So we have no ID identification <clears throat> with you right now. So no. You can't prove I am Kenneth. Just my uh, insurance card. Just had your name. Yeah. And to get so, an ID, you need an address. Need an address with uh, something with your picture on it. And I don't have that. So, so security is what I was doing until I got laid off with Allied. And now I can't even go back into security because I don't have a ID card. I don't even have proper attire to go to the interview. So I don't even bother going to the interview because they're going to ask that you have ID, you know, before they can even hire you. So security card, ID card for anybody to hire you, you know. So you started that process. You know how long that process is. It depends on your connections. It depends on who you know and who they know. It's, you know, it's, it's people that have resources, you know, that, uh, that you may not have resources to. So right now, the only person I got helping me is a lady named Katie that works with Reach and she works with the uh, food bank. So the food bank has a voucher, a brochure, uh, not a brochure, but a voucher where they'll pay for the ID. But you still got to have something on that box that you can take down to the Department of Licensing to say you are who you say you are. And birth certificate, who knows where that is. Yeah, you'd have to go through the Department of Vital Statistics in order to get a copy of that from the state of Texas. It's a mess. Yeah. That, that, that's cheap. That's like five bucks in Texas, but you got to... You got to be able to. Uh, you got to be able to obtain it. You know. I don't know if I can obtain it here through the state of Washington. But I don't know. But yeah. So I'm gonna go back to. So when you're a truck driver, mm -hmm. is that when you started? You're introduced to drugs. Or yeah, I had injured my knee. I fell off my truck when I was in the oil fields and. This was way before the uh, opiate thing was out of control. This was back in the early 90s. So doctors never told me to take it as prescribed. They just say what's on the bottle. So I figured it was okay coming from a doctor. So nobody really told me. We didn't have uh, addicts in my family, so I didn't know anything about it. You know, I heard about it on TV, but I wasn't, it wasn't in my household, so I wasn't exposed to it. So I figured as long as the doctor gave it to me, it was okay, you know. But that's how that got started. Before I knew it, in a year's time, I was hooked on them. And for the next almost 30 years, I was hooked on them. Yeah. So that, that caused you to lose your truck driving job. Truck driving job. Lost everything. Marriage. Housing, you know, I had everything going for me, you know, and when you hooked on them things Then you become uh, Doctor shopping or uh, ER junkie, you know That's all that's important to you nothing else that matters anymore, you know So my son, you know, I wasn't ready for him when he came to the world 92. I was in pretty bad shape, you know but he's, him and my ex-wife has long forgiven me. She didn't even know it for 11 years. That's how, I, how he, that's how he had I kept it. I kept it hid from her. That's pretty good, that's a long run. Though. Yeah, that's a hell of a run. That's trying to live two different lives, you know? Keeping, holding the job down, trying to keep my marriage going, and trying to raise our son, you know? And hold the job down, and keep those pills coming. 
Yeah. So I pissed away most of my life, you know. And uh, I look back on it now, and I hate I hate myself for a lot of reasons, you know, because of that. I would have been an architect by now, you know. There was a lot of people that saw that I had a gift. I didn't even go to school. I just had a talent for it. And a lot of people shelled out a lot of money to try to help me go to college. But then I'd relapse. And then I find I find other people that believed in me and then saw I had a talent and was willing to invest thousands of dollars of their money to pay for me to go to school, to get my supplies and all that kind of stuff, but then I would relapse. So there's a lot of people who don't even know if I'm dead or alive, you know. So yeah, I can kick myself in the ass for you know the people that I pissed over because of that drug addiction, you know. It's it's pretty toxic, man. It ain't no joke. It's not a joke. Yeah, I talk to a lot of people. You're not alone in that. Yeah. But uh, now that with the opiate thing so so bad now, I have to really really police myself, you know, to try to get get out from under this this sinkhole that I'm in, you know get off the streets, try to get housing. So uh, I'm kind of off, kind of working with a security worker in King County that's uh, trying to help me get uh, some some housing. You know, it's uh, just a bed in a closet, but it's it's housing. You know, it's it's uh, kind of like dormitory setup. Somewhere in uh, Lake Union, somewhere over there, somewhere. Now tell me if you got that what. What difference would that make? I could I could have hold the job down. And I wouldn't be out here, you know. And your identification you have address. Yeah, yeah. I use the uh, the food bank as my address. Yeah. So I get all my mail down the street here. Yeah. So that that, that helps. But being able to have housing, I could uh, not only get ID, but I can actually hold the job down because then I'd have somewhere to sleep. You know, like if I got a job working at night, I could sleep in the daytime and I'd have somewhere to sleep. But there's nowhere for me to sleep if I got a job working at night. I would be exhausted in within a week just from sleep deprivation, you know, not being able to rest. So I'm basically just, just trying to survive right now, but people are just so disengaged, you know, with the homeless situation and I kind of understand where they're coming from because there's a lot of homeless people that are just they just go around trashing the city man especially downtown turning over trash cans uh, spray painting the walls and the buildings knocking out windows so I kind of understand but there's some of us out here that are really trying to get back on our feet you know and that makes it they just kind of put us all in one category you know we're all the same and that's 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 not right we're not all out here just to wreak havoc on the community, you know, and just cause more problems, you know. We're just, some of us are trying to get back on our feet, but they're, with people that's got that kind of money, they make it harder for us to get housing because that makes the housing market, the rent and everything to just go skyrocket. I mean, I can't afford $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 a month. Can't afford that. When was the last time you spoke to your son and you had a relationship with him? Yeah. Nice. Uh, three days ago. Oh, nice. I talked to both of them. But he uh, he told me that, because uh, I'm trying to write a book about the, my 30-year addiction. The name of the book is called Sinkhole. And uh, there was some information that I wanted to get from him and her about my situation and he had told me that he couldn't pass judgment on me. You know, he said he forgave me a long time ago. You know, and I have two grandsons, his sons, they're twins. They are real little curly headed little devils they are. But uh they're my grandsons, but uh yeah they don't know that I'm out here like this. Because if they knew it they'd be trying to talk me into coming back to Texas and I, I left Texas because of the politics. It's a good old boy state. Yeah, we 
it's a Republican state, and I, I just I got tired of it. So I, I, that's why I came here. You know, things are better here, but they're just getting worse. You know, five years ago there were just a lot of opportunities here than it is in Texas. You know, but after the riots and the COVID thing. Now I'm regretting being up here. You know. but so when did you go from SeaTac to Seattle? Over almost two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've been on the street for about a year, you said? Yeah. Pretty much. Staying at shelters, you know, for the most part. Yeah. And how do you cope? How do you cope? What's your coping mechanism like? I know a lot of people numb out on this, numb out on that. Writing. Yeah, writing. Then I don't have a phone because I couldn't pay my dad gun phone bill. But uh, my music helps me cope. So I'm a big jazz. I'm a big jazz fan. So my jazz, my writing, and my drawing kind of really helps me cope. You know, but it's hard to get somewhere where you can draw unless I go to the library downtown, you know. But uh, my mom, she, she still thinks that uh, I still got, there's still a chance for me. You know, she, worst come, you know, worst come to worst, you know, I could always become a draftsman and just work with an architect, you know. But you got you to go to school for that. You know, I would love to do something like that, you know. So your mom's still around? Yeah, she lives in um, in Austin. Dad's still around? He's in Georgia somewhere. When's the last time you talked to him? Oh, almost 30 years ago. Yeah, I don't talk to him. I have no relationship with him. I'm not trying to have a relationship with him. He's very physically and mentally abusive when I was little, so, yeah, I had no relationship with him, yeah. If you were to, what would you want the people of Seattle to know? I think that the, the communities and the laws got to change. They got to change some of the laws here. They need to build more affordable housing here. Uh, you know, they got the tiny house projects in different places, but they don't have enough of them, you know. There's a lot of people out here that uh, just give an opportunity, you know, for a tiny house or some kind of affordable housing, you know. You got all these properties that are just sitting vacant, you know. Some of them don't even have a building on them. You know, they're tearing the buildings down, the lots just sit there for a year or two years and they're not doing nothing with it. But it's all about money, you know. It's all about wherever they can stick those condos at, you know, that's where they're sticking them at. But we can't afford that, you know. The average person don't make no sixty to $70,000 a year, you know. It's just the city of Seattle just needs to sit down with the homeless people, you know? Like, the city of Seattle, they got town hall down there. They need to invite the homeless people that are serious about getting back on their feet down there in front of the mayor and the executives that make decisions in the city of Seattle and just talk to us and ask us questions about what we can do or what they can do to help us get back on our feet, you know? and. As far as I know, in the last five years since I've been here, they haven't done nothing like that. Just inviting the, the homeless and the business owners and just have one big ass meeting, you know. And the homeless talk to the business owners, you know, especially the ones that want jobs, to have these business owners, you know, help out, you know. But after the riots, you know, everybody just kind of, a lot of them just moved out from downtown because cost too much money to stay down there with the vandalizing and theft, you know. Yeah. I think that would be a good start. Just invite the homeless man down there to the city hall. 
and just sit down and have a, some kind of hearing, you know, a summit, uh, talks or something. You hear, you hear your voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else, Candace, you want, you want to add? No, no. I appreciate your time, man. Yeah. It's That's not problem. too late. Architecture, you can still do it. That's true. Yeah, I got a birthday coming up. That's how old? I'll be 54. March 23rd. But well, I mean, you had this dream for a long time of being an architect. Ever since I was nine years old, I was drawing buildings. Yeah. And as I got older, my work got better. But like I said, when I when I seen Falling Water, the house that Frank Lloyd Wright grew and, and, and built and designed, that's what really got me inspired to, to get into architecture, try to get into architecture. And he still is inspiration, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, you didn't get the, you, drugs took you one way, and you didn't have the resources, it sounded like. To... You know, in that, I, I mean, I went through different rehab oh, programs yeah. and stuff, you know, over the years, you know, but uh, it was just, uh, Keeping a uh, uh, a strong source of support around me, yeah. yeah, at all times, you know. But uh, you want to use bad enough, you'll, you'll you'll isolate yourself, and you'll cut yourself off from those people because you know that they're not trying to hear it, you know. So you just kind of. Kind of go your own way and just kind of be a loner, you know. Yeah. So where, where do you sleep tonight? I stay at a shelter downtown that's run by King County. That's where I sleep at at night. It's been cold. It's been cold. Yeah. And then uh, out here panhandling, you know, some days it's raining, real cold, so I get soaking wet. I have to hop on the bus, go somewhere warm, so I try not to get sick. But uh, thanks to, that's one thing I can say about Seattle, they gave me, uh, I got real good health insurance. Pretty good health insurance that I can pretty much use if I get sick or something, you know. That's one thing I can say, they got a good health plan if you can't afford insurance. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah.